parents knew that if there was any kind of mischief in the town, that their sons would be the ones that would be blamed for it. Well, the, mother's, uh, the boy's mother heard about a clergyman in town who counseled with children. And she asked the pastor if he would speak to her boys. And the clergyman agreed, and he asked to see the, the younger boy first. So the younger boy, the eight-year-old, went in the morning to the, to the church and uh, went into the pastor's office and sat down in front of his desk. And the pastor asked him, the pastor was a big man, he had a booming voice, and he said, where is God? Well, the eight-year-old boy, his mouth kind of dropped open. <coughs> he sat there, he didn't know what to say. He, uh, he just sat there. And the pastor asked him again, he said, Where is God? And again, the boy, he didn't even make an attempt to answer. He was so shook up by the, the, by the question. So the pastor raised his voice to a higher decibel and said, Where is God? Paul wrote in his 
letter to Ephesus in the first chapter, in the third verse, he wrote, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. Just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love. And then verse 5, having predestined us to adoption as sons by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will. This theme of adoption is one that runs throughout the Pauline epistles, not only does Paul write of it, we will find other apostles that write of it, and we'll speak to some of those later, but countless ages ago, before God created the first human being in the universe, he created that human being, finally, ultimately, he would create us in his divine image, God had already sovereignly chose every believer to be his beloved and eternal adopted children, every believer, before the creation of the earth. Now, I don't want to chase this rabbit too far, but let, me, let us keep in mind that even as marvelous as this term adoption is, that does not, in fact, fully illustrate God's work of salvation. Because the believer is also <coughs> cleansed from sin. The believer is also saved from the penalty of death. The believer is also spiritually reborn. The believer becomes justified. The believer becomes sanctified. And the believer is ultimately glorified. And that's a lot of benefits. The benefits of salvation. Uh, more than even the term adoption can truly apply. S still, those who are saved by their faith in Jesus Christ, by the work of His grace, have no higher title than, that, than being adopted children of God. As I stand here before you today, I am an, am, am an adopted child of God. As you sit before me here today, if you know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you are an adopted child of Jesus Christ. We are children of God. Our name as children of God designates our qualifications that we shall inherently inherit, inherit, fully what Christ has for us. And he's got a lot in store. Yes. It is therefore far from incidental that Paul both introduces this chapter with the assurance to believers that you can no longer be condemned. And he ends this chapter with that same assurance. You can no longer be condemned. Paul wants you to understand that. Because Satan wants you to be self-condemning because he wants to lessen your witness to the world. Don't let him do that to you. Don't let him steal that from you. That's why we're, we're majoring on assurance. So as we begin this passage of Scripture, as we've looked back, we've endeavored to see the ways in which God confirms for us as believers that we are eternally related to Him. Eternally related to Him as His children. And we have seen that we are led by the Holy Spirit, and now we've looked at how we can gain by the elimination of fear and doubt and bondage in your life, you can have access to God by His Holy Spirit. And I want to talk to one other issue. I want to talk about your inner assurance, as Paul speaks to it in our source scripture today. So Paul gives us another assurance. In verse 16, he talks about the Spirit himself, the Holy Spirit himself, bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. The Holy Spirit speaks to your spirit and 
says, Steve, even when you mess up, you're still a child of God. Yep. And repent, confess, get over it, and get back on the pathway of sanctification. Be obedient to my word. Be obedient to my teachings. But let's get on with it. You're one of my children. And that's the assurance that God wants us to have. As we noted last week when we were talking about Roman adoption, that under the rules of Roman adoption, there had to be seven witnesses as to the adoption, just in case in the future somebody tried to refute that adoption. They had seven in case one died or another died or one moved and another moved. They wanted to make sure that there were witnesses to that adoption. We have a witness to our adoption. And it's God's Holy Spirit that works in us and through us and by the illumination that He gives us via His Word, by our obedience in walking in a sanctifying way, we are in communion with God and in communion with His Spirit. But I don't think that Paul has in mind here just some mystical small voice that says, Steve, you are saved. I think it's more than that. See, I think Paul might be referring to the fruit of the Spirit. Roger touched on it a little bit in Sunday school. Boy, I like to go to Sunday school because there's always something that applies to the sermon. When you see people that are in situations that, in the world's point of view, are just dreadful. And they are a Christian, and they are handling that situation in a completely different way. You see the fruit of the Spirit, like my brother Eddie. I've seen Eddie. I've seen the angst that he has over a situation in his life, but I've seen how my brother handles it. I know how he handles it. He handles it in prayer. He handles it in counsel. He seeks the Lord. And that's the difference. And that's that inner assurance about who we are and how we are. That's the fruit of the Spirit. Maybe Paul's talking about that fruit of the Spirit here. Or maybe he's talking as Acts 1.8 speaks about, you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem and in all of Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. Maybe he's talking about that power, that inner assurance, that power that we have. <coughs> Let me warn you, though, that power is there for a reason. Power is not there for self-gratification. Power is there, in this instance, so that you might be a witness. You're empowered to be a witness for God. It's the Spirit's presence, the evidence of that presence that assures us of who we are in God. See, when believers are compelled by their love for God, when believers are compelled by their deep hatred for sin, when we reject the world, when we long for Christ's return, when we love each other, when we experience the joy of answered prayer, when we are able to discern between the truth and what is an error, when we long for and move towards more Christ-likeness in our life, the work of the Holy Spirit is evidenced for us. And as believers, that evidence is a witness that we are children of God. Let me tell you about a 19th century uh, British pastor. His name was uh, Billy Bray. Billy Bray seemed never to have lacked an inner testimony and confidence about his assurance of his position in the Lord. Bray originally was a coal miner who was involved in a mining accident that almost took his life. He was known as a drunkard and as a very riotous type person. Well, in 1823, Billy Bray was saved after reading a book called 
Visions of Heaven and Hell, which is a good book if you, if you are ever want to uh, see heaven and hell graphically compared to each other. He became a member of the Methodist Church and was well known as a very unconventional preacher. By that I mean he would be preaching and all of a sudden he would break out singing. Or he might be preaching and he would start dancing around the floor. And uh, Bray did not get, just re restrict his, his, uh, his duties to preaching. He also raised enough money to start three other churches beyond, besides his own. And he was continuously overjoyed by God's grace and goodness in his life. I'll read you a quote from Billy Bray. He says, I can't help praising the Lord. As I go down the street, I lift up one foot, and it seems to say, glory. And I lift up the other, and it seems to say, amen. <laughs> and so they keep on like that all the time I am walking. Glory. See, 
That is a, an objective, unbiased evidence that you're truly God's child. And then in verse 21, John gives you subjective evidence, personal evidence. He says in verse 21, Beloved, if our heart does not condemn us, we have confidence towards God. In other words, you have to strain your emotions through God's Holy Spirit. Because emotions will get you in trouble. They will. Lust got me in trouble when I was 16. <coughs> emotions will get you in trouble. But when you strain things through the Spirit, then God has the, the impact that He wants in your life. See, when we function as the Spirit desires us to function, when we function in love, when we function with love, that love then is manifested in our lives and we can have confidence in our relationship with the Lord. Okay? Make up your mind that this is 
what is important to you. Is this important to you? Is it important to you? Okay. I'm going to quit beating that horse and break a new horse out into the corral. So I'm going to start discussing our next passage of scripture. We're going to guess the next the next series will be on the next two verses. Uh, let me say this, that whether or not we know it, whether or not we understand it, every genuine Christian lives in the light and the hope of glory. Okay, let me say that again. Whether or not we know it, or whether or not we understand it, every Christian lives in the light and hope of glory. And uh, I think that that thought is best uh, summed up by John in 1 John 3, 12. Beloved, listen to these words. Now we are children of God. Sound familiar? Okay. And it has not yet been revealed what we shall be. But we know that when He is revealed, we shall be like Him. We're going to be like Him. Jesus. We're going to be like Him. For we shall see Him as he is. Because of our trust in Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, God has graciously adopted us as his children. And one day John says, we, I didn't say, we shall be like him. Yes, one day we shall be like the perfect, sinless Son of God who took upon himself in order that we he took upon himself our sins, not only that we might share in his righteousness, which we share in now, but also so that we might share in his glory. You can say amen. Any matter that deserves an amen. We're going to share in the glory of Jesus Christ. Remember, when we started chapter 8, I think this is the 84th lesson in the 85th lesson in the book of Romans. So we started chapter 8 about two and a half months ago. In the second and third verses, we learned of the freedom that you and I have from sin and death. Okay? We then looked at how uh, God's law, uh, because of that freedom from sin and death, it enables us to fulfill God's law to the best of our ability. In verse 4. We then look at 5 through 11, which spoke to the changes in our nature, how we're different. And that, through those changes, then we are empowered for victory. We spoke about that in 12 and 13. And now we just finished 14 through 16, which talked to us about how to confirm your adoption as a child of God. Because Paul, Paul is very systematic in how he teaches that. He starts here, and he puts down this foundation, okay? You're free from death and sin. Because of that, now you're, you can start to fulfilling God's law. Your nature is changing as you go through the process of sanctification. You can have victory if you strive for victory. And I want you to be confirmed that you're a child of God. And now, we're going to see how the Holy Spirit, remember, this is a Holy Spirit-centric chapter of that Paul writes to us, he's going to show us how the Holy Spirit guarantees our ultimate glory. 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 Yeah. We're going to be glorious. It's hard for some of you to imagine me being glorious. But I will be glorious someday. <laughs> when I look in the mirror in the morning, I hardly see glory. But one day... I will be glorious. In these next two verses, we'll, we will begin to examine by 
focusing on the incomparable spiritual gain through that divine glory that you and I are guaranteed. This is like one of those, uh, those sales programs. We, this is guaranteed. No, no, no if, ands, or buts. The Bible, you know, when we read the Bible, we speak of the stages and aspects of salvation. We talk about regeneration. We talk about the new birth. We talk about sanctification and glorification. And we, we, we sometimes speak to them as if they are separate entities. And we can distinguish them from each other, but really, they're all codependent upon each other. They're all interwoven into, they're all covered by one big umbrella. The umbrella of redemption. All the as aspects that we use, all those, all those words that we use. And this is one of the many reasons, because of this codependency in the process of salvation, that I've always had a problem with someone losing their salvation. See, for me, if there is justification, if someone is truly justified, okay, then there's going to be glorification. Because there's only one power by which justification happens in somebody's life, and that's God. And you know what? God ain't going to stop it, and no other power is either. If you get justified, you're going to get glorified. Yeah. And that's an important point for some people. And, uh, but it's important for us to understand what we believe at New Life Family Worship Center, and that's what we believe. It's as Romans 8.30 says, Moreover, whom he predestined, these he also called. Whom he called, these he also justified. Whom he justified, these he also glorified. That's the process. And further on in, in Romans 8, in 38 and 39, for I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. 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 That's right. John 6, 30, 37. All that the Father gives me will come to me. All that he gives it will come to him. And the one who comes to me, I will by no means cast him out. That's not going to happen. So we're going to begin now, in these next two verses, we're going to look at uh, the glorious nature of man. Thank you. 
come and lay any burdens at the altar. If you need to praise Him, you can come down here and praise Him too. Okay? But uh, I'm going to lead us in a prayer, and then as, uh, as, as our, our folks sing for us this morning, just uh, take this time. Uh, I'll be up here in front if you need to speak to me or to anyone else. We'll, we'll bring somebody else forward to help you, whatever the need might be. So let's uh, all stand, please. And let's join in prayer. Father, we, uh, Lord, we thank you for the spirits working in our life. How, Father, uh, you have uh, designed uh, yourself to work in and through us. And, Father, uh, I just want us to be people of assurance because it's by that assurance that we find our perfection in you. We start on that pathway now. As we walk down that path, we should be becoming more perfect each and every step as we go. Uh, and Lord, you have, you have an expectation of us. And Lord, to find that perfection, to find the perfect plan you have for us, we have to be willing to submit to you. And that begins, Father, by accepting you as our Lord and our Savior. So Lord, if there is a heart here today that doesn't know you, it's our prayer, Lord. We lift them up to you. And we, we give that matter over to you, but it, because it is by your spirit that they will be convicted. But we pray for anyone that might be in that situation. Be they someone who is new to church, or be they someone who's been in church forever, but really has never let you be their Lord and Savior. And Father, we, uh, we do uh, lift up our prayers to you and concerns for family and friends. We, uh, we come before you and we give this time to you. Knowing, Father, that you have uh, a time uh, to lay burdens, for us to lay our burdens down. And Lord, whatever the need is today, whatever uh, the situation might be today, we just ask, Father, that you would take this time and use it for your people's lives. And we pray this, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen.